本人がしてる<笑>いつもより難しいかもしれない<笑><笑><笑> Okay, then I would like to start the uh, very good presentation and uh, could you please make a、uh, screen share? Oh, yeah、um... Information is a repeat from last time、uh, when I gave this talk in June, but、uh, there is some new information. I'll try to highlight that as I go through the presentation and、uh, just like to talk about、uh, what's going on right now、uh, in embedded Linux. And my normal outline is I'll talk about some of the kernel versions that we've had in the last year, go over specific technology areas,、um, and then talk about the CE workgroup projects. A few miscellaneous other things, and then give a pointer to some resources. So let's start with kernel versions.、Um, Linux kernel versions we've had in the last、uh, year are these ones. And notice that、uh, actually the, for、uh, the last year, the, the delay has been, or the, the amount of time per release of the kernel has been pretty consistent、uh, for. Four releases in a row is exactly 63 days, which is a little bit odd.、Uh, but it lengthened a little bit for 4.1 and 4.2.、Uh, maybe that's just something happening over the summer. Basically, that's only seven days different, so that's just a week here or there.、Um, I'm gonna, we just had the Linux 4.3 merge window,、um, and I was happy to get a couple of patches in this time.、Uh, so, I'm、um, looking forward to the, seeing those show up in a final release sometime in November. So, my prediction I'm going to go with kind of close to 70 days and predict that it's going to come out on November 8th.、Um, so, but we'll see. The kernel summit is toward the end of October. That may push it out or it may pull it back. It's hard to predict these things. It's just kind of fun. There's not, it's not really very important how long it takes. It's just kind of interesting to watch the cycle. So, just some of the features in those kernels that、uh, I'll talk, some of these I'll talk about more、uh, when I get to、um, specific technology areas.、Uh, but I wanted to highlight、uh, which versions of the kernels these were in. So, there's PowerWare scheduling in Linux version 3.16, and there's more work ongoing with that.、Um, also, in 3.16, again,、uh, yeah, this is about a year ago, we had the decode stack trace. Uh, script that allows you to、um, take stack traces that you get from the kernel 
and convert that the offsets in those into file names and line numbers. That's really handy for uh, trying to find uh, problems. Um, and then F2FS uh, continues to develop in features. That's the uh, F flash friendly file system. Um, in 3.17, we saw lots of new ARM hardware support uh, thing from all kinds of different chips. Uh, the uh, Rock, Rock chip SOC is a bunch of all winner. Tegra from, from uh, NVIDIA, uh, Gumsticks, um, and uh, AM 4037X, a TI evaluation board. So, um, And then there are a bunch of other ARM boards uh, with existing support. So those were all new boards. Uh, there were a bunch of uh, other things that saw improvements with Linux 3.17. So we're seeing a lot more uh, ARM hardware support in the kernel, and that's a trend that's continuing, but uh, uh, needs a, there's needs a lot more work, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, also, we saw a rework of the config bisect mode in KTest. So uh, KTest is one of the tools inside the kernel source tree for doing testing. It has the capability of doing, um, actually bisecting a config. So you present it with two different configs and it'll figure out which option is, is causing the bug that you're seeing uh, that's different between the two. Uh, in Linux 3.18, OverlayFS was introduced. Uh, there was a size reduction patch, uh, and I'll talk more about this later when I get to size uh, size issues. Support for the LLVM compiler, uh, I think this is really interesting uh, because I think it's very useful to have uh, more than one compiler that can that can uh, you can build the kernel with. Uh, it means that uh, both of them uh, have to work to uh, improve their features, compete with each other. And then some more SOC support. Uh, high silicon is showing up, um, and uh, Amlogic, Renesas, Broadcom, and Atmel. So there's a lot of SOCs that are getting kind of their basic support into the kernel. In Linux version 319, uh, F2FS now has a fast boot option, so that's a welcome addition. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. A device tree overlay support. Uh, SquashFS now supports LZ4 compression. And the Android binder code has been moved from the staging area. And that's one of the last big pieces of, uh, of the Android code. There's a couple of little bits that are still left in staging, but most of the code that had been contributed a couple of year, years ago for Android, uh, most of that has moved out of the staging area. So there are, there are bits of Android code that have been developed since then uh, that are not uh, in mainline yet, there's still a fair amount. Uh, I think it's about 600k, but um, but a lot of code has kind of taken its place in the in the central in the main upstream tree. So that seems to be coming along well. In Linux version 4.0, uh, Linus first first obvious difference with this one is it's not a 3.x release. Uh, it's the first uh, 4. Dot something series. Uh, Linus conducted a survey and, and basically went with the, the preferred. It was not preferred by a lot. Only 50% of respondents preferred 4.0. Uh, but uh, it was interesting. He says probably about every 20 or so releases he'll, he'll consider changing the major version. There's no real meaning to it. Uh, there's, there was no significant major feature between the 4.0 series and the 3.2 series. Android Binder. Um, uh, added uh, some security hooks, and so it can now uh, use SE Linux security with the binder. Uh, that's useful. Uh, uh, SE Linux has now been used in uh, uh, Android for a, a while now, and seems to be uh, doing pretty well at providing uh, better security for the system. And then we saw the first, in Linux 4.0, first non-volatile memory support patches. Um, so you can use a file system that uh, exists in persistent memory. And this is a trend. We're going to see more and more of this uh, as, we, uh, as we see more of these systems uh, show up in the market. And then some UBIFS performance improvements. In Linux 4.1, we saw a new TraceFS file system that I'll talk about later. Um, the kernel self-test system uh, is getting some more traction. It now has an install target, so that's uh, one part of the 
the puzzle or the component, uh, getting getting it uh, giving it the ability to support cross-compiled environments like embedded systems. Uh, and then also uh, the ability to attach BPF programs to kernel probes. BPF is Berkeley Packet Filter. So there's several different um, virtual machines in the kernel, uh, and one of them is Berkeley Packet Filters. It's uh, used for networking packets. Uh, so it allows you to construct um, basically programs and handle things in a programmatic way in the kernel. And so you can now use that, that same virtual machine to uh, run essentially what are scripts or programs associated with probes. Uh, so you can do very complicated probes. That's good for debugging and things like that. The I2C subsystem it can now function in change mode. And uh, you can configure the kernel for single user operation. And I'll, I'll talk about that as well as uh, system size. And then the last released version of the kernel came out just a couple of weeks ago. Well, three or four weeks ago, I guess. And Linux 4.2. And it had a couple of interesting features, Linux security module stacking. Uh, the F2FS uh, file system now supports per file encryption. It has a little bit of support for AMD GPUs. And uh, interesting, look, just looking at some of the miscellaneous drivers that went into this, there was a lot of pin control drivers. Uh, so um, this release, uh, for some reason, had, had a lot of work in pin control. I think there's been a push to get some of that stuff in. So Freescale, MediaTek, All Winter, and others. And then uh, we're seeing several features. Um, they're under the name libnvdm, or N nvdim. Uh, non-volatile memory management. So there are several features have to do with um, how the kernel uses persistent memory. Um, and there's things like um, make, uh, segmenting it off and making sure that user space can't uh, touch certain parts of it, or even the kernel can't touch certain parts of it, uh, similar to what GrabFS file system did. Uh, but this is uh, this is very so we're seeing more and more support for this type of memory. You know, Intel obviously has announced a, a big push uh, to do some um, non-volatile memory in, in future systems. Um, and so I think we're going to see more and more of this. This will be showing up um, something to watch in the future, how Linux can use this and how, how it kind of changes the whole system architecture. Uh, so we haven't had. You know, we're in the. We just finished the merge window, I think. Yeah, we're and so we are. I think we're at four point three RC one right now. Uh, there was not a whole lot of uh, interesting embedded stuff in this one, although there was uh, one, a, a couple of things that uh, are interesting. So there's thing, this thing called Most, which is a media oriented systems transport. Uh, that is a framework that is used in the automotive market for multimedia networking, and that support is now in staging. So uh, a little bit of automotive um, support, uh, automotive support for automotive standards is, is making its way into the kernel. Of course, we had other things to support automotive, like CAN bus support and, and things. Uh, but more and more features are getting into the kernel uh, specific to that market. And then the code for the EXT3 file system, the standalone code for the EXT3 file system, has been removed. Uh, that doesn't mean the kernel doesn't support EXT3 file systems. Um, it's just that uh, in the kernel there have been two uh, sets of code, the EXT3 code and the EXT4 code. The EXT4 code is backwards compatible, so that should be able to handle the EXT3 file uh, systems OK. Um, but we'll see what happens with that. Um, so a couple of things that I think are interesting to watch over the past year, uh, they've been trying to put dbus support into the kernel, and they've been having some problems. It's hit some stumbling blocks getting merged to dbus. Uh, I think it will get merged eventually. Greg Crow Hartman is involved in this one, and he's pretty persistent. Uh, there have been or some objections, but he's, uh, he's been working to overcome those. Uh, I haven't heard recently on this. This was about April and May time frame. Uh, but uh, then kernel signification, there are people working on trying to get very, very small kernels. Um, and I saw, I've seen a couple of patches go by, only a, a few of them have gotten adopted. 
Uh, but I'm hoping to see some more uh, from people who are interested in taking Linux into very small systems. Uh, the RT preamp patch, uh, that's something to watch. I'll talk a little bit about that more later. The persistent memory that I mentioned, and the SOC mainlining process. So there's a progress. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to get uh, mobile and other system-on-chips code mainlined. Um, so those are just some things to watch. And then I have just kind of an observation on um, the general kernel process. Uh, the kernel merge process seems to slowly be getting better and better over time. Uh, so there's an article in LWN.net, and there's a link to it at the bottom there. But basically, the percent of changes that are accepted into the kernel after the merge window closes is trending down over time. And so what that means is, so there's an integration tree, which is the Linux next tree, and uh, a bunch of, uh, all, a whole bunch of different trees, I think it's over 100 trees now, are integrated into that tree before they even get accepted by Linux into the merge window. And so there's a chance for a lot of bugs to get shaken out and, and issues to be seen. And uh, so this percent of changes that are accepted after the merge window, that really is an indication of how many fix, how many things are broken uh, during that integration or that are found once, once it gets to Linus. And so it was this, uh, almost 20% in 3.0 and it's down to about 10%. And it's been steadily declining. Uh, and so it, you know the whole purpose of uh, of having the merge window is to is to put everything together and and then you have some R, the RC series to let things shake out and so there'll always be some there but it's a very healthy sign that uh, the Linux kernel processes are getting better and better. Um, so let's go and talk about specific technology areas. Um, so in terms of boot up time, and these are uh, roughly alphabetical. Uh, F2FS, I talked about it having a new fast boot option. Uh, this is a, an option that you can turn on for the file system. It skips some boot time checks uh, to reduce mount time. Uh, sacrifices a little bit of normal runtime performance uh, because there's, a, there's operations that are done during normal file system operation, but it's not very much. I think it's on the order of like 2-3%. Uh, and it gives you uh, very, very much improved uh, boot times. There were some very good talks on boot up time uh, at ELC Europe last year. Andrew Murray, one of my one of my favorite speakers on boot time, and then John Mahaffey, also uh, well respected, a long time veteran of the industry, uh, talked about fast boot tool, tools and techniques. Um, in terms of some, uh, areas of speed ups. Uh, there was some discussion in the last year about deferred init calls. Uh, there are still people using that uh, set of patches. Those are still out of tree. No one's really made a push to get those in. Um, but they're available if people want to look at them. It's, they're very kind of specialized. They kind of exemplify why boot up time is, uh, is kind of manually intensive because the mainline people don't want to accept this kind of the special patches to do some of these things. Um, current, Kernel tinification project, as that project makes progress, of course, we'll have smaller and smaller kernels, which will mean shorter load times. And then at the very, very extreme, in terms of load times, you have XIP. And Intel uh, has uh, released a set of patches to show XIP on x86. So just as some platforms are removing XIP support, ARM, uh, x86 is adding it back in. Um, and of course, with execute, XIP stands for execute in place, and it allows the system to uh, basically uh, do away with the load time uh, because it's executing uh, directly from Flash or somewhere else. Um, and then user space speed ups, the big news here is uh, with system D. Uh, so people are increasingly using system D embedded. I'm not a huge fan of system D, but um, it does it's being used more in desktop distributions, and there's a, a talk on some of the issues with using uh, system D embedded uh, that was given by Alice and Chinkin uh, at ELC, so that's that's worth looking at. Uh, now, moving on to device tree. So there's been a lot of activity on device tree. Um, device tree has been kind of a problem historically. It, it uh, is a relatively large shift in how one writes drivers uh, for for Linux, 
the DT maintainers are a little bit overloaded. Thomas Petazzoni gave uh, a pretty good talk about some of the problems there, uh, about how a device tree really is not uh, suitable to be a stable ABI. Um, and device tree is getting much more complicated because uh, of the need to do uh, dynamic configuration. So a lot of boards that have daughter boards that, pe that users can change in the field need changes at boot time. Uh, and so they're talking a lot more about dynamic device trees. And uh, Pantelis uh, Antonio has been working on this quite a bit. He has a couple of presentations out talking about this and making progress on getting this supported upstream. Um, some of the other new work that's going on is uh, there's work on validating device tree. So device tree is a kind of a dumb data structure. Uh, it does not have, it's not like C code where there's type checking and, and all kinds of compi compiler checks. There are, there are some compiler checks for syntax and things, but nothing on values or, or the, the structure definitions. And so Matt Porter has actually uh, been working on creating a formal binding document. Uh, so the, the documents that are in the source tree now are just plain English text. So a human has to read them and determine that what they write in their uh, device tree source file um, matches what's in the spec. And what they want to do is convert to an automated system that can actually uh, read those binding documents, have them computer readable, uh, and then uh, automate the process of looking at the device tree and validating that the, the information in them is correct. And several people have been working on that, including myself and Frank Rowan. Um, so the way it works is the binding docs would be compared with the binding schema, so they're validated against some kind of uh, structure. The DTS entries themselves would be compared against the doc binding doc and error errors are reported. The end ultimate goal would be to add this to check patch so that uh, the upstream kernel doesn't, doesn't ever have to worry about any kind of uh, errors, these types of syntactical errors. Um, so that yeah, before you even submit a, uh, a change to the Linux kernel, your DTS file would get validated and make sure it matches your driver and all that stuff. Uh, so some of this discussion will happen. There's a Lenaro Connect is here in the Bay Area in California next week. And there's a meeting to discuss some of this, and uh, hopefully some of the stuff will get shaken out. And we can also discuss it at the uh, Embedded Lens Conference coming up in just a few weeks. Um, one thing that's uh, maybe interesting, if you know Frank Rowan, I think several of you do, he has uh, now been made a device tree maintainer. So uh, he's got a maintainer role in the kernel. And he's been updating uh, Elix.org device tree file. And uh, recently, he's been spending a lot of time looking at uh, device tree debugging issues. And so he's got a paper that he's, he, well, a presentation that he's given. He gave it at uh, LinuxCon North America. And there's a link to it on, uh, on that, that following page, the device tree presentation of papers and articles. And they had a big session with plumbers this year, and that's how some of this new validator work got restarted. So things, are, things seem to be going along pretty well. Uh, I think that's it for device tree. Um, in the area of graphics, uh, something I just stumbled on recently is there's a new API for graphics uh, that uh, AMD has been has been promoting and has been adopted by the Chromos group. And this is an alternative to Directv3 3D or OpenGL, and uh, hasn't worked its way yet into the um, into the embedded space, although I just read an article uh, this morning that says that uh, the uh, Android, the guys at Google and Android are looking at supporting this. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. So AMD has announced, the, well, the, the purpose of the, the API, which is called the Vulkan API, is uh, to reduce CPU overhead. So it simplifies some of the, some of the pipelining, and particularly the way the renders are done, the shaders are done, so there's kind of more direct control. Uh, OpenGL requires that you compile some of the shaders into an intermediate language. The intermediate language for the Vulkan uh, system is, is different and I think uh, intended to be somewhat simpler so there's less CPU involved in uh, graphic operations. AMD has announced plans to open source the driver for this. 
uh, Intel and Valve are already working on an open source driver, so there should be, so this is something to be looking at for the future, where we maybe, uh, instead of doing OpenGL, uh, maybe we'll be looking at Vulkan APIs for our 3D work on, in the future. In terms of GPU support, uh, there's several, several projects going on uh, for open source drivers. Uh, of course, all of these vendors, um, the Adreno is the Qualcomm one, Mali is the R one, uh, NVIDIA uh, is, uh, yeah, NVIDIA is the company. Uh, but so there are these open source projects for the different ones, PowerVR is also in there. Um, so Free Greeno, there's actually been quite a bit of progress made on the um, a driver for the Adreno GPUs is on the Qualcomm chips. And so you have uh, support for OpenGL uh, ES30 and 3.1. There's still some pieces that need work. This was reported on uh, quite a bit at um, ELC by Rob Clark, the guy who's doing this. And he developed a bunch of reverse engineering tools uh, that should help with uh, not just not just uh, uh, his own, the Free Greeno project, but anyone doing GPU work would benefit from those tools. In terms of Power VR, we don't know very much. Just in June, we had uh, one of the executives from Imagination. So Imagination is the company that um, created Power VR and sells Power VR GPUs, the IP blocks to different companies. Power VR um, GPUs have shown up in Intel chips, and they're very popular also in MIPS chips, uh, which led eventually to Imagination uh, uh, buying MIPS. Anyway, there's this rumor that's going around because of a blog post uh, talking about um, open an open power VR driver for Linux. So we'll see if that happens. This is re pretty recently from June, so maybe we'll see something later this year. Uh, other OSS GPU drivers, the Nubo driver uh, is coming along. Uh, it's still in active development. Uh, NVIDIA published some GPU details, well, a couple of years ago now in 2013, but you can go uh, to the nouveau.freedesktop.org site to see what the status of the project is and get drivers for that. And then the Lima project unfortunately seems a little bit stalled. Uh, there was a discussion about putting some of the Molly code uh, into DRM KMS into the kernel and mainline, uh, which would be really nice, but uh, there didn't seem to be an active user space. So the Lima driver appears like they made some progress with the Molly 400, but uh, didn't get much beyond that to the latest, the latest uh, set of Molly hardware that's out there now. So that's kind of the stat of, status of uh, GPU drivers. In terms of file systems, uh, we've got SquashFS supporting LZ4 compression, we've got the OverlayFS, um, which it was took a long time to get into the kernel, it should be really useful in some use cases and embedded. Um, uh, there's a, been a proposal for uh, UBFI, UBI FS handling of MLS uh, multi-level flash man. Um, there's lots of complexity in this, but uh, Boris Brazilian gave a pretty good talk talking about uh, how this could be done. And then, of course, ASD3 removed from the kernel. 4.3 RC as of 4.3 RC1, it's out. We'll see if it makes its way back in. Uh, one talk that I want to just point out, if you're looking at evaluating different file systems for embedded devices, uh, Tristan Lelong, uh was, I think it was with Adeneo, uh, embedded Linux company, and uh, gave a talk where it showed their analysis, gave lots of different uh, performance numbers for all these uh, five different systems. Uh, the summary, if you don't want to go read it, is that F2FS is, is pretty good. It's probably the fastest of any of those file systems, it's designed specifically for uh, flash media, which is what almost all embedded systems are using. Um, but ext 4 is very mature, so it's probably the most robust. So not a lot of surprises there, but good to get some hard numbers on that. Uh, let's see, power to me, power management. Uh, uh, some of the stuff that we saw at this year's ELC and at uh, LinuxCon Japan, uh, we talked about idle and suspend idle, uh, PM domains, um, and then how to use PowerTop and how to tune things. This was, that last talk was kind of
kind of more about uh, how to tune a laptop distro, but had some good information for people uh, looking at optimizing power for their system. Um, let's see, in real time, uh, the RT preamp patch is probably the most common way that people get uh, hard real time on Linux. Uh, there are still quite a few people using Zenimai. The good news about RT preamp is that there is a sponsor, uh, Thomas Gleichner is the main maintainer of the RT preamp patch set, and I think uh, I think I heard uh, that he has actually got a roadmap for getting some more stuff upstream. Um, and there are a number of different RT solutions, uh, and uh, Jim Huang uh, talked about it uh, at last year. He talked about uh, all the different solutions, and including a new one that he has proposed, RTBox, a thin multiplexer uh, for hard real-time applications. So there's, uh, if you want to do hard real-time with Linux, you have uh, lots of options, and they're pretty well supported. Uh, although um, nothing. You can't do it with just a uh, uh, strict kernel.org kernel. All of these are external patch sets at the moment. And then there are people using uh, programmable real-time units. So several chips have uh, these separate uh, hardware units uh, for handling real-time tasks. And uh, there's been talk about integrating support for them into the kernel and how to, how to use them. In the area of security, uh, the big thing that everybody's worried about, of course, is uh, Internet of Things. Uh, it's very, very difficult when you throw networking in. Are we back? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Internet of Things raises lots of security issues, uh, and uh, there's a, there was a really good talk at Linuxcon Japan uh, talking about um, how to uh, reduce the attack surface, how to techniques for kind of limiting uh, some of the security issues on the Internet of Things. Uh, so, some of that will work its way into uh, kernel features, uh, but others just requires uh, some good practices on the part of the industry. Uh, the other area of security uh, that I talked about a little bit is security module stacking. So we have several different security systems, uh, security module systems in the kernel, uh, like SE Linux and SMAC and um, others. And now you can actually put more than one of those at a time. So I don't know if stacking uh, actually increases security or just makes things doubly complicated, but uh, but this is something uh, that people have been working on literally for about uh, eight years, is getting, getting the ability to stack different security modules in the kernel. So we'll see how that works out, what kind of features that, that allows. Uh, in terms of system size, uh, there is a size project, a kernel timification project, and they've got their own uh, their own wiki for this stuff. They actually made some progress this last year. They got the single user patches in, so you, not, you can now get rid of users and groups in the kernel if you want to have a very stripped down uh, system that only has, well, it doesn't have root at all. It just has no users and groups. Uh, no user and group, uh, group permission, so the opposite of the security, I guess. Uh, and then you can remove command line parsing, uh, and there's, uh, 
places where uh, I, each each individual command line option that you parse is not very big. So for if you take out the option to parse an it call debug, that's one of the kernel command line options. It only takes out 385 bytes. But the idea is that um, you have the ability to take any command line option and just make it a static option. And in aggregate, there are thousands of these options. So if you get rid of a ton of them, and then just make a couple of the ones you need static, you can save quite a bit of memory in the tens of Ks. Um, and then the Intel x86 XIP patches are also, uh, besides giving you a, boot, uh, a boost to your boot time performance, uh, reduction of boot time, you also get a size savings and the amount of RAM needed. I think that's actually the primary purpose that Intel did these, because uh, I thought it, over the last year, Intel's really been focused on low footprint devices. Uh, some recent talks that are worth looking at. Um, there were uh, a couple of ELC, Linux for Market Controls. Vitaly Wool is doing some really good stuff. Jim Huang. Um, <clears throat> notice uh, Vitaly Wool's talk, he got the kernel down to, uh, I think the whole kernel was under a meg of RAM. Uh, and so that was pretty good. Uh, and then Andreas Farber also talked uh, about uh, very, very small devices. Um, notice that all, that all three of these were ST micro devices. Uh, so uh, 32F series. So apparently everybody's having the same idea on how to use Linux on those platforms. Um, in terms of testing, there's a couple of things going on. There's the KSELF test project. Uh, inside the kernel. I'm quite excited about this. Shua Khan from the Samsung is heading up this project and I uh, already talked about the fact that we have the ability to install tests. That was mainlined in kernel version 4.1. Uh, so you should be able to cross build the tests and, uh, and install them on a target. Um, and there's the LTSI test project, which we've talked about before, is Jason's based test automation. It's available now. Uh, we had some meetings at our, uh, well, we had a workshop at, in Tokyo as part of uh, LinuxCon Japan. And Kojin Embedded, who's the contractor on that, is fixing some of the issues that were raised at that meeting. But, and we encourage everyone to give that a try, test it out, and let us know uh, how it works for you. And then another independent test uh, thing. This is kind of the one that's, uh, uh, it's that. So, Lenaro has its own test infrastructure, but this is a set of Lenaro engineers, including mainly Kevin Hillman, uh, who's one of the ARM maintainers, has a board farm, and uh, you can, if you send them an ARM board and give them, set it up, they, they'll set it up for you, and you get continuous integration testing. So he's currently building 126 trees uh, continuously. I don't know how many boards, I think, I think it's above 50 boards. And then they automatically send out patches, and they can they can do things like actually um, they will bisect do a git bisect to find the actual patch that introduced the bug that they found. Um, and so there's a presentation on that if you want to learn more about it uh, at DLC. And one interesting note: Sony Mobile actually has uh, one of their phones is in the test farm, so we we get. We can go look on a daily basis and see if anything upstream has broken our, our build for our phone. Um, in terms of tracing, a couple of uh, miscellaneous things. Berkeley packet filters uh, has shown up. They can be used for dynamic tracing. It looks like because of that, KTAP uh, will not be merged. I was a big fan of KTAP. But it showed up at uh, LumsCon Japan 2014. Uh, or was it 2013? Anyway. But uh, apparently, uh, it, it had used its own command language, and instead, the the kernel community decided to go with uh, this virtual machine, the Berkeley Packet Filter virtual machine. Um, there's a the tracing has, has gotten to be a big enough system that it's now been moved out of DebugFS, and it's, they've given it its own file system. Uh, to so it doesn't look any different from user space, but uh, it was apparently it was complicated enough that they needed to separate it out. And there's some histogram code, uh, code to do histograms uh, for some of the tracing activities. Uh, it's pretty interesting. That's not mainline yet, but that's uh, in the works. And there's a good talk by uh, Elena Zanoni at Linuxcon Japan uh, about some of this stuff. 
Just a couple of miscellaneous things uh, floating around the industry that are kind of uh, interesting. So there's Graybus. Uh, this is a project uh, to do, it's a new fast bus uh, for mobile device hot plugging. It's specifically uh, for Project Aura, uh, being worked on by Greg Crow Hartman. Um, so there's quite a bit of work. Uh, we, we will get the kernel device support for this uh, into the kernel uh, relatively quickly, uh, but to support all the dynamic hot plugging that's needed for Aura and for other, other kind of high speed bus uh, switching uh, up in the upper portions of the Android stack, uh, that's going to take a little while. Uh, but it's being worked on, obviously, by the Aura folks. Um, and then J2, this is something that I had uh, didn't didn't see coming. Uh, open hardware processor, formerly SH2 uh, processor, but patents have expired on that, and so now it can be used in an open source way. Um, and actually, there's a whole presentation. I had Rob Landley is is here at Jamboree today, and so I don't. I'm not going to talk a whole lot more about this, but uh, I think it's really interesting. Uh, I'd love to see uh, open hardware get a lot of attention, and uh, the idea of being able to kind of, um, you know, the uh, Rob and uh, the other people involved with this, Jeff Dion, have have shown uh, how you can actually compile uh, the processor code, put it on FPGA, and uh, you can so you can customize the hardware at the same time you're customizing the software to run on it. Um, and all open sources. I think it's pretty cool. I think it will lead to a resurgence a little bit of the GNOME and U code for Linux, which I think is really good for the low end side, and uh, eventually fulfill my dream of having Linux run on super, super cheap processors. Uh, but we'll see what happens with it. Um, I'm kind of excited to see what happens. Um, okay, the next part of this uh, major areas is the C workgroup project. Uh, so there's actually not a whole lot of these. I'm going to talk about the contract work and the projects and initiatives. Contract work, we only have three in flight right now. Uh, we have kernel. We have there's some more projects that are have been proposed for um, for the funding, uh, but we have not actually uh, approved those yet. So these are those are not on the list. We're actually having uh, CE work group meetings in. Dublin in about three weeks as part of ELC, and so we'll, we'll we may add some to this list if we get some funding approval for those. But these are the three we're funding right now: kernel string refactoring, uh, device tree documentation, LTSI test framework. So the kernel string refactoring, this is based on Wolfram Sang's uh, results. Uh, he did some investigation on compressed print K, determined that it was not a good idea to do a full compressed print K, but he did in the process. Uh, of that research, find some uh, really simple things to do that uh, just by refactoring kernel strings, uh, uh, consolidating some of the message handling uh, to, to get quite a bit of savings out of the existing messages. And so he's going to go ahead and do that work, and uh, hopefully we'll get a report on that next year when that gets finished up. And that's a, basically the purpose of this is to uh, reduce the kernel size. So it's part of a size effort. DT documentation project, Frank uh, Allen has been collecting data and has uh, actually got an outline online at the, on the eLinux wiki, uh, again to help ease some of the pain of uh, learning about and using device tree. So that is in progress. And then the LTSI test framework, I already discussed that, that's the JTA stuff. Um, that we encourage people to try out. Um, let's see, so we have a couple other projects and initiatives that the CE workgroup is working on. Uh, this is the list, but I'll go through each of these. So the Civil Infrastructure Project uh, is intended to solve problems with Linux for use in social infrastructure systems. Um, I think we're currently in the status where we're holding some additional meetings to define requirements, and I hope that we will be able to discuss some more, some of this more at ELC. Um, let's see, the shared embedded Linux distribution. Toshiba did uh, quite a bit of work on this, uh, supporting, uh, creating a, a, a Yocto layer uh, that would allow them to take Debian packages and, uh, and use them with the Yocto project to create an embedded distribution. 
Um, and so this seems to be coming along okay. Um, I'm not sure how much collaboration we're getting from other companies, but uh, hopefully some. The device mainlining, I know the most about this one because this is the one I'm working on. Uh, the goal is to study obstacles to mainline and work to reduce those obstacles. And I've talked a lot about this in the past. Uh, we did the developer cert a survey. We had some special interest group meetings. Uh, we've done some presentations and a white paper on different obstacles that there are to mainlining and how we might overcome those. Uh, we did our uh, analysis of mobile phone source and identified some of the problem areas. Uh, those tools that we did to uh, to analyze the code, those have been published and they're on GitHub. So if you want to look at your own phone or your devices, add a tree code and, and look at it, you can. This is the uh, a little chart very, very briefly and very, very simply. It's much more complicated than this, but this is where the main areas of code are that are out of tree. So mock MSM, that is uh, the, uh, the processor-specific code. Uh, MSM, in this case, is for the Qualcomm family of SOCs. But this is typical uh, between uh, three and 500K of code is just specific to a particular SOC. is kind of generic you know, for things like regulators, blocks, uh, pin control and all kinds of low-level drivers like that. But then you get into kind of the generic drivers, media, video, wireless, um, and all of that code, there's kind of, there's a lot of code that needs to be uh, cleaned up and, and uh, ported up the main, main line. So we've actually started working on some of this. So USB was not on that list, but should have been. Um, two areas that we actually have started some technical projects. Uh, we have a USB on-the-go charger integration. So there's what I would consider to be kind of a flaw or a deficiency in the USB stack. Uh, the current upstream USB stack does not have uh, very much code in the way of uh, to support how the USB port is used on all mobile phones use their USB port for both USB and for charging, and there's no there's no integration of that. There's no support in the USB frameworks upstream, so we're working on that. Uh, and then the Broadcom wireless driver is used by almost everybody, and it's not upstream, so we're trying to get that. That's almost 100k of code. Uh, we actually uh, there's more than uh, there's a bunch of people interested in this topic. It will be discussed at the Kernel Summit coming up, and so we've put together a wiki page that shows the different in a bunch of these different technical areas, what some of the issues are, and uh, a little bit about who's working on it and what they're doing. There's also some non-technical things. So there's technical projects which are just, okay, we want to get code up, upstream in the mainline. But the project is more than just uh, more than just talking about code. It's also talking about uh, making it easier for corporate developers to get involved. And one thing that's come up is an easy patch submission tool. Uh, one, one problem that corporate developers have is they're behind firewalls or their mail clients don't work well with uh, community processes. And we want to uh, just get rid of that as an obstacle. <coughs> so uh, there's been discussion about how to do a patch submission tool uh, that bypasses all the email things. And then also engage with more companies and individuals. Uh, part of Part of uh, the obstacles is uh, convincing management that this is valuable and useful to do. And uh, the targets to talk to, the next next people that I want to talk to are Google and MediaTek. So we're having meetings at Lenaro Connect and at Meta Lynch Conference Europe and at the Kernel Summit to uh, talk to a bunch of companies about uh, this effort. Um, LTSI, we've heard quite a bit about LTSI. Uh, so I'm not going to cover a whole bunch, uh, just that uh, current LTSI kernel is based on 3.14, so getting a little bit old, um, and so the next LTSI will be based on 4.1, which is the next LTS, and we are considering multiple merge windows and, and doing some other stuff there, and uh, we'll see what happens as we continue to support that. I think it's a very valuable thing for the industry uh, to have a kernel that we collaborate on. That's a little bit behind me line. And then finally, uh, the eLinux Wiki. So uh, I think everybody knows what the eLinux Wiki is. I hope so. We have lots and lots of pages. We're continually updating it. There's uh, lots of information about specific boards or specific processors. 
as well as information about boot up time, real time security, power management. Uh, I am looking, this is kind of new, I am looking for people to take over specific sections. So there are a couple of these sections that are have good information, but it's a little bit out of date. And so if anybody would like a very, very small part-time pass, uh, maybe one or two hours a week uh, to help uh, go through the old material and kind of bring it up to date. The main thing is just finding the articles. So you don't even have to write new material. We just got to create links. Uh, organize the material we already have. People have given tons of talks in the last three or four years on boot time. We just like to make sure we we have links to all those in one place so you don't have to go looking through all the different presentation pages to find that stuff. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, doing something on the Enum Tweaky, kind of a, uh, a specific assignment, please contact me. So you can email me at tim.bird at sunnybubble.com. Um, or look me up online. I'm, you can find out who I am. Uh, I think my address, email address is on the email next week, or it's in the kernel source tree. So. Um, anyway, a little bit of other stuff. Uh, projects and consortia, distros and build systems, and then events. So uh, Linux is getting into all kinds of new places. Uh, well, MIPS is not new, but there's now a MIPS organization, Purple Foundation. Uh, that is doing some projects to support the, the MIPS um, architecture, which is very good, I think. Uh, Linux is making big inroads into specific vertical stacks. There was a movement in the uh, automotive space. Uh, AGL, I didn't really talk about automotive in this one, but uh, another big area is in drones. Uh, the first drone summit was held at ELC in April. And Andrew Trudel was actually on the program committee at the LC, so we had, I think, some really good stuff. Well, there'll be some more drone stuff at ELC Europe. Uh, not quite as intense as it was in uh, in uh, April, but good stuff. So it seems to be moving along pretty well. Uh, in terms of distros, Android, uh, what is there to say, really? You Google kind of drives this. We're getting ready for the Marshmallow release that has these features. Um, Tizen is kind of plugging along. Uh, recently, they've done a lot of security work, uh, and the first Tizen phone, the Z1, uh, was released, and uh, people got a chance to take a look at it. Uh, the automotive, uh, great, what is it? automotive Linux group, ALG or AGL? I don't know, I can't remember if that's one. Mistaken. Anyway, they've announced their own. They're going to do their own distro, and then the CE work group obviously has its shared embedded distribution that people can use. So there are different distributions people can use uh, for uh, different things that they're doing in the embedded space. And then build systems, I don't really have anything new to discuss about these. These are the two kind of main ones, uh, Open Embedded in the Octo Project and Build Group. Uh, I don't have anything to discuss at this time. And then here's the events coming up. Oh, Linux on Japan, uh, these, that is past. So I really should get next year's dates up here. The Linux Conference Europe coming up on October and Embedded Linux Conference 2016 in April this year in San Diego. We moved out of the Bay Area. And where do I get all my information from? I get it from lwm.net uh, and uh, also a lot of it from obviously from the, the talking to people at various events, um, LinuxCon events and Embedded Linux Conferences. Uh, when doing the work on uh, researching the kernel, I use quite a bit of stuff from the kernel newbie site and then uh, eLinux Wiki um, and the C Linux that mailing list. So that's it. And thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Christine, I have one question about uh, ELC. Maybe yeah. quick soon we will uh, start the uh, session proposal or solicitation. When, when will it Will it be Oh, that's a good question. I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> I should find that out. Uh, I've been so busy with ELC, I'm getting ready for ELC Europe. I mean, yes, I, know, yeah. but I, I don't know when the ELC dates are. Um, I will find out and send an email out to see Linux. Good. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, 
system B is I don't know it that well um, and uh, so it's it's unfamiliar to me I think as it gets uh, used more in desktops people will become more familiar with it the other complaint I have is that it's um, it's very uh, it's kind of heavyweight right now so they have done some work to reduce the footprint of system D um, it used to be quite large, but it, re it, it requires quite a bit of services in the kernel, so it means that the, you cannot have a super tiny system with system D. Uh, you have to have control groups, and uh, there are some other features that it requires out of the Linux kernel before it'll work. And um, it itself is not too, very small. I think the minimal system D configuration I've seen in user space is about 70K. Uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're doing a super tiny system, that's quite a bit. Uh, to get back to your question, though, I think uh, I think it will just be like any other component. It's already in the Octo project. It's it's uh, integrated into that, and uh, I'm pretty sure I haven't checked, but I'm pretty sure it's in Builder as well. So I think it's just one of those things that uh, will get integrated into the embedded systems and the, into the build systems, and they'll just be. A, uh, a package like any other, you know, we have. So, in, in terms of the long-term support of it, I I think it'll be okay. Um, it, but it is kind. Of, it does have kind of its own little interesting quirks that we'll have to get used to in the embedded industry. And we may actually. Here, here's the thing that I think we'll have to start doing is um, as we start to use it ourselves, we're going to have to go in and start giving the system D community. Um, what our requirements are, and they they've been pretty good actually. They know that we have size requirements, and um, and obviously the whole one of the big benefits of System D is that it was designed around fast boot up, and so it's actually way better than a knit scripts or or even Android's a knit system um, for for boot up time. So they're actually helping us in one of those regards, but. A lot of the complexity they have in terms of their journal handling is kind of not needed in the embedded space. So it'd be nice to be able to uncouple some of those things. And we may have to go in and just help um, break it apart or, or keep it modular uh, so that we can just take the pieces that we want. So that's kind of my opinion on system B. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim, and oh. I hope you have a good weekend. And okay. we, we will get into the so-called silver week, and uh, next week many of the uh, you know, Japanese companies will be closed, so that uh, you will not be annoyed uh, for the communication with the Japanese people <laughs> for next year, next, next, next week. Okay, well, I look forward to uh, seeing some of you in uh, Dublin, Ireland yes, in uh, about so. three weeks. Yeah. So. Anyway. Thank you very much, Tim, and have a good good evening. Okay, thank you. See we'll you talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming.